um, that I sort of discovered when I was looking for a common thread between all the chiller trips we had last week. Certainly what Robert saw was a cause for a trip, um, but what was interesting is when I started looking at it, we had three trips last week. Here, here, and here. But when I looked at those trips, um, Robert's uh, observation only really applied to the first, to the most recent one. There was some significant valve activity on Air Handler C on this one, but it wasn't full stroke like Robert was seeing, or 70% of stroke. And on this one, there, you know, Air Handler C was pretty stable, um, which I'll show you here in a little bit. So I decided to focus in on that one. Um, what you're looking at here is a plot of flow on the secondary, supply temperature, and then return temperature. And so if you zoom in on that and look at what was going on around the trip, what I noticed was there's a really strong correlation between, um, or appears to be at least, between flow and, and temperature. And I thought I'd look at the hour before that and see if that held, <coughs> and it did, actually. So um, I zoomed in on that a little bit more and basically laid the supply temperature on top of the flow, which is what you're looking at here, and then the return temperature on top of the flow. And basically what you can see is that there's a very strong correlation between the flow and temperature. So that um, what that means is that flow instability um, triggers temperature instability, and that temperature, as you can see right here, you know, flirts with the free stat trip setting. Um, right there, it does it right there. And th this goes to the issue Walt's been, uh, you know, mentioning that, you know, the chillers really are just protecting themselves um, from an issue that's caused by some other thing going on out in the system. Um, now, one thing that's interesting to notice about this whole event, for the whole week, there wasn't one point in time when the secondary flow was below about 110 GPM. So <clears throat> that means the events we had last week weren't low secondary flow events like the events we've had before when we've been doing the low flow test or the system just didn't have much load on it. Last week there was, you know, fairly significant amount of flow on the secondary even during the trips. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. So I got to thinking about well, what could cause the flow to vary. And I thought, well, maybe the VFDs are hunting. So I took a look at them and what you can see is that doesn't appear to be the case. The VFDs are fairly flat, um, yet the flow's wandering around as much as, you know, well in this case here, it's wandering around over 20, almost 30 GPM, and real easily 10 GPM a lot of the time. So uh, then I decided I'd look at what the valves in the system were doing, um, which is what this is. And if you look at this, what you can see is the A valve <coughs> just flat out wide open, which is how it's is how it's been and actually still is because we're trying to drive those basement zones down still. The C valve in this case was very flat. I mean there's some waviness to that pattern but nothing like Robert was seeing. Um, but interestingly enough the B valve you know showed a you know an oscillation that sort of correlated fairly well with the flow. And so if I zoomed in on that and laid them on top of each other, you can see that there is a really strong correlation between what Air Handler B's valve is doing and the flow variations in the system. Um, the C valve is wandering around a little bit, but not near as much as the B valve. The B valve is about four times, or once every four minutes. It's about 15 times an hour. And it's only like about a four, three or four percent change in output that's causing the flow to vary as much as 25 percent. So the valve you know, it's very significant in its ability to impact the flow on the secondary. And so I guess what I'm suggesting is that we really need to look into stabilizing that, that flow. Uh, and to do that, I think the trick might actually be getting the air handling unit B control valve to be stable. Um, you know, it's not out of the question the flow is driving the valve crazy, but I think it might be the other way. And so what I'm suggesting is, as a real easy test, that we simply take a hold of this air handling unit B valve command and lock it down to something like 39%. I picked 39% because if you um, look at look at what's been going on, like for that whole week, well, this is a graph of the of the uh, supply air temperature on air handling unit B, the blue line, and the uh, 
valve command, the purple line, as well as the average, which are the fuzzy lines in the middle of those. And what you can see is for the whole week, the B valve, except when we tripped, was pretty much floating around, around, you know, 39, 40 percent. And so what I'm saying is if we took control of that valve for an hour or two and just locked it down to 39% or whatever the current value is when we do the test, if I'm right, when we lock that valve down, it'll stabilize the flow in the secondary. Um, now, this problem, as you can see, is very persistent. I mean, there's a whole week of it right there. And I just went in today and pulled some data back to see what's going on. And you can see it's still going on today. Um, this is an hour today. Um, if you expand this back out, you'll see the pattern has pretty much been there for the whole data set that I pulled. Um, so I guess I'm proposing we do a, a test here where we lock down the B valve command and see if the flow stabilizes. Um, and if it does, then I think we really need to look at you know, how to fix that problem with the B system. It could be it's just some loop tuning, but it could also be the valve so sensitive that it has so much authority in the system right now. Uh, it could be the valve just isn't the right size or doesn't have the right shaped uh, port, the right port characteristic for the situation we actually have in the field. So we may need to resize the valve or change the port if that's possible. Um, it could be that if we lower the differential pressure on the system that we're controlling, that will help mitigate this issue. But I'm not sure we can do that because I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Gary and Ron have already tested and the pressure we're holding is pretty much what we need to deliver the flow to the uh, downstairs area. But I'm not positive about that. So one step in the process, if we prove it's a valve, may be to, you know, sneak the set point down on the on the differential pressure we're holding up in the penthouse. Um, so I'd like to propose we do that test and see where it takes us. Um, the other issue here, I mean, aside from the fact that we're setting up a pattern that is, you know, setting setting us up to trip the chiller up, um, four cycles an hour, so, you know, over 150 or over, I'm sorry, yeah, over 150,000 cycles a year. Well, the design life on the Bulimo actuator that I believe is on that valve is about 60,000 cycles. And so we're setting ourselves up to wear the actuator out, wear the packing glands out, basically a, for an all, a long term O&M issue that'll probably come up in the warranty period. Um, I had this problem with a valve at Komatsu where the operator's complaint was this valve, there's something wrong with it because we're wearing the packings out every three to six months. And I told them, you know, is the valve hunting? They said no. Um, and I just, to troubleshoot, I set up some trends, and I looked, and it was hunting. It just wasn't hunting full stroke. In fact, it was such a minor hunt that you couldn't see it. You had to put your thumb against the valve stem, and then you could feel it moving around about an eighth quarter inch. Um, so bottom line is we fixed the hunt, uh, which in that case was we had to change the characteristic on the valve port. Um, got the valve to stabilize at load and uh, replace the packing glands once and basically those packings were still there when I left the plant. Um, you know, they lasted you know, over a year after that and, and I suspect they would have lasted longer. We just shut the plant down and I had to move on. But anyway, they, we went from failures every three to six months to, you know, a, a year and no problems. So that's another reason we need to fix this. Um, even if it isn't the exact cause of the chiller trip, which I think it could be at least some of the time, we still need to fix it to have longevity uh, of the valve uh, actuator and, and packings. Thanks. I'll post this on the website along with the spreadsheets and create an action item.